Though Chesapeake and New England colonists proudly considered themselves fully English, the realities of the continent they inhabited made life in the colonies different and unique. America was a vast and untamed wilderness, increasingly populated by immigrants from all over the world, and yet dominated by Native Americans, who were the most populous people on the continent until the late 17th century. <clears throat> the second wave of English colonists re reproduced quickly, and early growth of the colonies was less about immigration than a healthy population, at least in the north. Medicine was rudimentary and rooted in humoralism, though most people dealt with illness and medicine themselves or with the aid of a midwife. Still, as agriculture and imports improved, the population in the colonies doubled every 25 years, and fully 2 million English people called the colonies home by 1775. That is not to say that life in the colonies offered a common experience. Differences between the people of the North and New England and the South, the Chesapeake, certainly existed and, including, and included longer life expectancy in the North, a more dist uh, distorted sex ratio in the South, a lot more men than women, differences in parenting styles, and a stricter adherence to the patriarchal Puritanism uh, in the South. The system of American slavery was something new on the face of the globe and existed as a product of circumstances unique to the time and place. Southern and Caribbean English planters had money but struggled to maintain and control a sufficient white labor force to grow tobacco and sugarcane. The first American slaves were purchased from older Spanish island plantations, slaves from the old trade uh, who weren't always black. As the sugar, tobacco, and rice industries boomed, though, American planters required more slaves than the Spanish could sell them, so they turned to the African slave trade directly. As demand in the Americas increased, it became financially beneficial to find more and more reasons to put more and more Africans into slavery. Slavers soon resorted to kidnapping people from neighboring tribes, mostly, in order to fill the orders placed by American planters and traders. The trade quickly devolved, and African slavers and whites worked together to begin to capture free and innocent people, uh, forcing them to take the Middle Passage, a terrible journey across the Atlantic uh, packed in ships like sardines. Eleven million people were taken against their will to North and South America before the slave trade ended. It started, um, the people that were being brought were criminals that were put into slavery. Whether that's um, a good thing or not, it was something that was happening on the African continent in, in, in uh, I guess, in a much smaller scale. Once Americans wanted slaves, they created the conditions to just put free people into slavery to make it somewhat legitimate and happen mostly on that continent. Once they got here, all blacks were treated as slaves, uh, whether they had committed any crime or not. And, and uh, later in the trade, of course, they hadn't. The slave trade was certainly affected by the laws of economics. Prices fell when competition for slave labor began in earnest in 1697. To get right down to it, it became affordable and culturally permissible to own slaves in the colony as early as 1700. The number of slaves in the colony soon exploded. There were a quarter of a million by 1760. And their legal status was uh, always highly ambiguous. In the American South, slavehood quickly became understood as permanent and children inherited their parents' bondage. That is something new. Not even in Africa did that exist, where you, you could be born into slavery. This American system made le uh, was made legal when colonial assemblies began to pass slave codes that used color to mark status. Whites were universally free. Blacks were permanent servants in the American South. For American slaves and their families, the only way out of forced labor was death. While hundreds of thousands of blacks were being forced to the Americas, not just the American continent, but the islands too, to work in the sugarcane fields, an equal number of Europeans were arriving of their own volition. The most distinctive and enduring feature of the American population is that it is comprised of, uh, by a diversity of races, nationalities, and ethnicities. 300,000 Huguenots, or French Calvinists, uh, German Protestants, 12,000 uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, German Mennonites, and Scots-Irish, and other Scottish and Irish uh, migrants arrived in the 18th century. These people came to America to escape religious persecution, but they also came for more modern problems like unemployment and the high price of rent in Europe. Economics in the Chesapeake, or the South, took on distinctive patterns in the 18th century. The southern agricultural economies of Maryland and Virginia were prone to boom and bust due to unpredictable and uneven tobacco production and prices. South Carolina and Georgia became heavily reliant on rice production. Cash crops and raw production soon became the name of the game all across the South, the Chesapeake. Across the North and New England, 
Soil and climate were not as favorable, favorable as in the South, so a commerce economy accompanied a small-scale agricultural economy. Blacksmiths, cobblers, rifle makers, uh, millers, printers, shipbuilders, etc., they all took root across the Northeast. Metal workers and other businesses and, uh, that utilized and exploited natural resources like furs, wood, um, mining, and fishing created a, co a commercial middle class unique to the northern colonies. Poverty and isolation were early markers of the American experience. Lack of access to commercial markets meant few pots, few candles, few wagons, few roads connecting rural communities across the colonies. The myth of colonial self-sufficiency, though, is challenged by reality and sober historical reflection. Few families made their own clothes and most relied on imported manufactured goods. Obstacles to trade and commerce were, commerce were however, incredible. No real uh, currency existed, that we didn't have dollar bills, and gold and silver were rare, so bartering and the uh, trade of beaver skins uh, made the economy work. Trade between the West Indies, the Caribbean islands, England, Europe, and West Africa created a sort of triangular trade system whereby Caribbean sugar went to New England to be uh, distilled into rum, and then colonial rum, furs, and natural resources were funneled to Africa and Europe in exchange for slaves and manufactured goods. The demand for European uh, manufactured goods grew with the colonies. A unique 18th century colonial style consumerism was spurred by class differences and desire to demonstrate membership in the upper crust. The beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England created an economy for luxury goods, uh, both in the Americas and in England. Merchants and traders advertised their goods in newspapers. Tea, glassware, cookery, and furniture soon became more common in colonial homes. And the idea of gentlemen and ladies came to dominate themes in American advertising. So even though these colonies are isolated, and just uh, just a hundred years ago um, they were, you know, trying to barely survive a winter, uh, pretty soon they're importing goods from Europe and they're sitting on very nice couches made in Europe. Social mobility, though, uh, remained unique to America. The class system of England uh, failed to entrench itself in the colonies. And white people continually found opportunities in the colonies. No one was stuck in the lower class or the upper classes. You could fall or you could rise in America. Community life in the colonies uh, varied by region and economy. Plantation life in the Chesapeake or in the South uh, was precarious and tumultuous for most white owners. As plantations grew in size, black society, culture, and religion found expression. The slaves often found themselves at the mercy of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse common on many southern plantations. Slave protests and efforts at rebellion were often muted, but the Stono Rebellion of 1739 exists as evidence of a deep and undying desire for freedom among uh, early American slaves. In New England and the North, communities were built to be neighborly, featuring annual town meetings and an equalizing practice of anti-promogenitor. Uh, that is where inheritance from the father spread among the sons instead of to the eldest, diversifying power and preventing the concentration of wealth and land. So when a father dies, if he's had a very successful life and has a lot of money, he doesn't leave all of his money to his firstborn son so that his firstborn son has all that money. It gets spread among all his sons, and that's unique to the North, and it ensures that no one can stay rich forever in the North. No family can just dominate. Tensions flared up, though, uh, when sons who stood to inherit very little moved uh, to organize new communities and anxieties over, over religion and gender roles in the North expressed themselves in, witch, in witchcraft sta scares, a preoccupation over Satan's influence and other religious extremism. I move very quickly there. Let me say that again. Uh, when uh, a father dies and uh, the last born son stands to get very little, or if there's 10 sons and not very much money, um, that can be tough on the younger son who sort of has to start over. And so a lot of those younger sons who inherited very little would leave a colony, um, it would create some anxiety and some trouble. Uh, you have a lot of people sort of moving around across the north, which isn't common across the south. Uh, the, the part about witchcraft scares there, uh, that, is, um, uh, that is a product of the relative religiosity of the northern colonies. So all those people that came to the Americas were mostly fairly radical Christians. And so occasionally, um, when a community is sort of dealing with a problem or something like that, you get these sort of witchcraft scare, uh, scares. Like if a woman fails to get married and lives alone and, um, you know, little kids tell stories about how she's a witch, uh, these sort of things can actually sort of snowball because people are so religious. If they see evidence of some sort of witchcraft, these sorts of uh, weird sort of witchcraft scares 
um, happen across the North because people very much believe in the power of Satan. So I'm sure you've heard about the witchcraft, Salem witchcraft trials, etc. Those things happen because Americans in the Northeast are so religious. Cities of New England, including uh, Philadelphia, population 28,000, and New York City, population 25,000, existed as urban centers in the North, uh, centers of commerce, crime, imported goods, traffic, intellectualism, and they included the intellectual roots of the coming political revolution. So not only is the North the uh, place of uh, religiosity, it's a place of political um, interest and ideology. As differences between the New England and Chesapeake colonies solidified, an emerging conflict between the traditional personal God and the Enlightenment ideals of science and human reason played out in America in a way unlike anywhere else on the planet. From the get-go, American colonial churches and faiths coexisted, changed, and multiplied, putting tolerance of difference at a premium in the colonies. Western migrations, though, continually split up churches and made the declension of religious piety a perceived problem across New England. So what I'm getting at here is Americans are very religious, but uh, your neighbors might practice a different religion from you, so you have to deal with that. So tolerance is very, very important, but as those men in the north uh, don't inherit money, they move around a lot. And so there's always a concern, just like those witchcraft scares, there, there's a concern that as people move around and are, are uprooted, they'll lose their religion or their religiosity. And so Americans are very anxious about becoming not, even though they're very religious, they're concerned when p other people aren't equally uh, as religious. They're concerned about secularism, and that, um, and that certainly goes hand in hand with the Enlightenment. In the 1730s, a secularism, or um, sort of a godless way to sort of perceive the world, as that took hold in northern communities, a religious fervor swept the colonies. Called the Great Awakening, English evangelists and open-air preachers traveled the, the American countryside, making appeals to women and young, rootless sons. The idea of igniting a personal relationship with God appealed to those estranged from opportunity in colonial America. Both in northern and southern communities are creating a schism between old light, quote-unquote, and new light, quote-unquote, Protestants. The Enlightenment followed the Great Awakening and preached a different message, that natural laws and reason and science could create progress and advance human knowledge without a need for God. The Enlightenment, which came from Europe, drove interest in education, government, politics, promoting a secular worldview that sometimes clashed with the message of the Great Awakening. So even though America is uh, this very sort of religious place with all these religious colonies, uh, we have this big fight between secularism and sort of science uh, and religion play out as early uh, as the 1730s. The Enlightenment coincided with a number of human advances both in Europe and in the colonies. Advances in printing technology created cheap almanacs and Bibles, encouraged literacy in the colonies, and the first American newspaper was published in Boston in the 1690s. Formal schooling rooted in religious tradition became a cornerstone of early America for boys. Though slaves and women were only provided informal training and education, after 1700, nearly all American elites were being educated at American universities instead of established English or European colleges. So they were staying at home to go to college. Advances in science, i.e. smallpox vaccinations, and technology, electricity, were early markers of an American commitment to the ideals of enlightenment despite our, our religious foundation. Though English colonists certainly shared values with and remained connected to their brothers in England, American colonies in the 18th century had grown accustomed to limited expressions of self-government, often without parliamentary oversight. When England later began to tighten its grip on the people of its English colonies in America, an imperial identity crisis threatened.